Hurricane Helene Situation Report as of 06 October 2024. I'm Kevin Pennell, host of the Hope is Not a Plan podcast. I'm an IT healthcare project management leader with a background in public safety, special event planning, and incident management and disaster response. And the purpose of this episode is to provide kind of a numerical snapshot the impact transition from search and rescue to recovery mode and try and help you all consolidate information that you're probably getting hammered with on social media and the news and all that kind of stuff and provide that that common operating picture that we all want, which means we have shared um, knowledge and then share some resources if you're interested, which hopefully we all are, in helping the folks that were impacted by Hurricane Helene. Welcome to the Hope is Not a Plane podcast, where we address tough questions head on, face our problems, and highlight our hopes by providing actionable planning steps to improve ourselves, mind, body, and spirit. Now, let's get logged in and get locked on to this episode of the Hope Is Not A Plan podcast. Welcome back, everybody. Again, go to hopeisnotaplan.org for more info, and I'll put links in the show notes and on my website uh, where you can help. So a brief overview for Hurricane Helene uh, from the 23rd through 28th of September is kind of the official storm time. Of course, now the impacts are still being felt here in early October. Massive loss of life, property damage, landscape's been changed forever in many areas. And so let me share some of these statistics. What what was this storm? Um, what did it do? And kind of where are we now? Something to keep in mind is even before the hurricane made landfall and then slowed down a little bit, dropped tons of rain, They hit. there was already 10 inches of rain in the areas, particularly in the mountains of North and South Carolina. So this area was saturated, saturated with water, right? And water can only go downhill and downstream to the ocean so fast. And so when Hurricane Helene hit, it was a Category 4 hurricane and it made landfall on the 26th. And the Category 4, four means there's a Saffir Simpson hurricane wind scale. And here's what a Category 4 means in that definition. Winds 130 to 156 mile an hour. Catastrophic damage will occur. And here's a description from the official kind of weather uh, definition there. So well-built framed homes can sustain severe damage with loss of most of the roof structure and some exterior walls. Most trees will be snapped or uprooted, power poles down, fallen trees and power lines isolate residential areas, which we've seen tons of. Power outages leak weeks, possibly months. Most of the area will be uninhabitable for weeks or months. And that doesn't include the once in a lifetime flooding that happened. And I'll get into some of the heights of that flooding, which are just unbelievable. With the hurricane, you get surge, a lot of storm surge, mostly that that threat is from the coast, right? Like the coast of Florida, the ocean, those kind of things. This impact was more inland, but with those wind and that much rain that fell. And so what's reported for Helene in those categories, sustained winds anywhere from 20 to 70. And this is from um, the National Weather Service in different areas. That's sustained. So imagine constant 20 to 70 mile hour winds, gusts 53 to 90, right? And so that's as it hit these areas as it slowed a little bit from that category four, but that's crazy, crazy speed. Rainfall totals from Helene in the region, right? In the major states that were impacted are North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, and Virginia was on the low end 17 inches and on the high end 30 inches of rain. That's an unbelievable, that's almost three feet of rain. That's crazy. And the flood crests, and these are random spots. Again, it's from a National Weather Service report that I'll link to. Um, And the Catawba River, nine feet above, the Broad River, two feet, Transylvania, a foot, uh, and that's in America, Uh, and the York River, 24 feet, 24 feet flood crest, right? So when you see, and and on YouTube, and there's folks out there um, putting tons of great videos out, one of them is Mark Honeycutt, which I'll share more about, who's talking to folks out there, showing us videos, when they show where the river was, and it's still high, and then where it went to, it's just, it's um, mind-blowing, frankly. And so with all this high wind, unbelievable amounts of water and these flood crests where the rivers and just land, even some of the videos you see like farms, whole fields just flooded. They look like lakes. You can't even tell they had crops in them. Numbers on the weather front. Operationally, we're at a period that's very hard and it's the transition from rescue to recovery mode, right? And this is a mind shift. And at some point, the searchers and the leaders who are coordinating these teams have to decide that that rescues are no longer possible or feasible. And yes, there are miracles where we find folks under rubble or somewhere and they've been there for three days or a week or however long, but that's the likelihood of that is very low. 
and it's a gut-wrenching decision, and it's hard to shift the focus from trying to pull survivors from the water or the trees or collapsed structures and shifting the mindset and resources to recovering bodies, right? And as some locals report, there's bodies stuck in trees. And, and again, go to Mark Honeycutt, M-A-R-K, H-U-N-N-E-Y-C-U-T-T uh, report on YouTube. He has a, a great interview and a couple of videos. Uh, great meaning we get insight. Um, horrible because you can see the tiredness with the woman he's talking to, the impact. Um, but he's in Red Hook, North Carolina. And he talks with a woman who's a river guide there and a search and rescue technician. And part of this mindset. And she, she really prompted, and it's important too, just to, to get folks ready. Right. There's folks that haven't heard from their loved ones um, and they might not. And it's a hard mental shift to think and hold on for all hope. But um, she shares that there are bodies in the sand, they're in the trees, they're under rubble. And that means we have to focus if we're the folks planning and operating and going out there to fatality management. And this is one of the ugly parts of emergency management and planning because we have to think about how do we store bodies of deceased humans? That's hard on the psyche. There's also a very practical challenge, right? Because we have to access the bodies that are buried, somehow get them out of the trees or out of the debris. It's physically and technically hard to do. And then it's hard to determine where and how to store the bodies. And this is part of fatality management pre-planning that every emergency management agency does at the local, state, and hopefully federal level. I say hopefully because I'm only familiar with the local and state really, but a practical question is when you reach out to companies and we see semi trucks go down the road with refrigeration all the time, but they're for food and it's hard to get food companies or beverage companies to say, yep, you can have these trucks or use them to store bodies in and then use them again for food. But they're necessary conversations we have to have. And in this crisis management, we want to do the greatest good for the greatest number, even if that number are deceased, because it helps their families and it helps us take care of them. And solutions that I've been part of planning for include partnering with forestry trucks because they refrigerate seedlings in trailers, right? And the tree isn't as freaked out as having a body in that, that truck as a food company, right? And so... Additionally, medical examiner offices have trailers that have cots in them for the bodies, and then they have these cooling blankets. This is tough stuff. It, the goal is slow decay so that we can then properly dispose of the body or store it or whatever we're going to do to the to the needs of their family, to the person's wishes if they already know, right? And we still need to take care of the living. As hard as the, the recovery of the deceased and the storage of them is, that's where we need to focus on these family assistance centers, these are centers that have practical administrative support like insurance, funeral arrangement, spiritual support, mental health and grief counseling and other things. And there's another term you may hear called family reunification centers. And that's largely for when we know people made it right. We're going to reunify you and your child, let's say, after a school shooting. And even then, not everybody's going to be able to be reunited. And so the planning is shifted to focus to assistance because you can't reunite everyone. And in this case, unfortunately, we may not be able to reunite everyone that's missing, that was washed away, that we hope got up into the high country and got away from the water. But it's really important for us to prioritize resources. And I'll get into my after action assessment kind of from afar and based on similar incidents or, or just, you know, planning to share some more numbers there's estimates now and again it's early and i mentioned this in the previous episode most estimates and uh, reporting is wrong or it's going to be updated constantly every day as new information is discovered but the estimated just for virginia and i'm a virginia resident um, from the virginia cooperative extension is just in southwest virginia alone 125 million right the impact and total estimates based on various websites different numbers all over is essentially from the single digit billions to hundreds of billions Right, because in some of these areas, they're going to have to rebuild them as if they never existed. So now I want to share, as of yesterday, the most important impact, the human impact that's been reported. And this is from CNN, and there's numbers all over. And again, the final numbers we won't know for a while, unfortunately. But I want to take a moment and think of and pray for the 113 people in North Carolina 
the 48 people in South Carolina, the 33 people in Georgia, the 20 people in Florida, the 11 people in Tennessee, and the two people in Virginia that are reported to be deceased from the storm. And all those efforts and all those things I just talked about are a way to honor them and take care of their bodies in the way that their families would like them to and to give them closure and peace. And I wish all their families Godspeed and to all those that 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 worked to save them, that saved some, that tried to save others. My assessment so far, uh, from afar again, right? So I'm armchair quarterbacking this a bit. As a former planning section chief, so someone that would come in, they would say, we need help doing these things, and I would help them organize it. Is from what I'm seeing from the reporting, from the variability reporting, from the complaints, from the different posts. And again, take all of these with a grain of salt and with a filter of emotion. Is that overall, there needs to be improvement in the joint planning coordination, right? There should be one process and one area command, which means we're all going to work together in this whole region, do it by state, do it by whatever, but we're going to work together to coordinate a whole bunch of things that I'll talk about. We're going to set up bases, which is a place where we have our people rest and eat. And then there's staging areas where we have all these folks that are volunteering where they're ready to go to moment's notice to deploy. We need to coordinate all that. That's a problem already that you can see. And you hear it in that video I mentioned. The second thing is improved collaborative messaging. The messaging is tough to be nice. The external messaging in between, in particular between local, state, and federal public information officers, right? So the local folks need to work better with the state that certainly need to work better with the federal government. There's so much hate going around from the public in different areas and rightfully so in some cases, but that's where public information officers can get ahead of that, not in a BS way, but in a real way. And part of that is also rumor control. Right, The state's working together in joint statements and joint discussions, and we hear you saying this. Here's what we're trying to do. Thank you for letting us know. But not having a, a they said, we said, all that kind of nonsense because that's what it feels like, and it shouldn't. The third thing to me is in, to improve operational logistical coordination. There's stuff flooding in from all over the place, big equipment, small equipment, supplies, people. That has to be coordinated. As much as this initial survivor, you do whatever you need to do to save people immediately. Doesn't matter. We're not going to work some process and put a plan together. You do what you have to do. You do on the fly planning that way. But now there's tons of stuff and we don't want to waste it. We don't want to not get it to people that need it. So we need to have joint logistical support between local, state, and federal logistics sections, right? And there are chiefs that help coordinate those. That means they can set up distribution centers. They can set up areas where we can put all the water is going to be here. All the, well, I heard it's going to get cold there. All the, the propane and other supplies they need. They can help coordinate all the supplies coming in and work with those PIOs, public information officers, to get that message to folks to say, thank you all so much. If you're flying supplies in, bring it to this area. If you're bringing it in by this direction, bring it to here. And you can do that across the states, within the states. And that's critical. So what what I hope to see is that we have better joint operational planning. We are messaging better collaboratively across the, the local, state, and federal agencies and that we're improving the logistical coordination now that the sun's out literally and we have a little room to breathe and we can say, okay, just like um, the woman that was interviewed said, these are small volunteer fire departments. They're, they're not warehouses. So there are resources in, I know the state and federal government where they can make a big warehouse. They have giant tents. They have, they can set them up just like a military base and do all that stuff. So it's time to get that rolling. Hope in times like these is critical. Hope is what's keeping buried disaster survivors alive. Hope is what keeps the exhausted residents moving through the destroyed property. Hope is keeping the hardworking rescuers and volunteers flooding into the effective areas. Action is what's making shit happen. Actions the people living in the affected area took to prepare and evacuate to help their fellow man. Action is saving lives, distributing water, and clearing the landscape so people can move throughout the region. So how can we use our hope to fuel our action to help the Hurricane Helene victims? Here's some general guidance. Contact the state emergency management agency you live in. Most of them have things stood up, which I will share. Other guides are cash is king. Now, in those guides, when you see on the emergency management agency, they'll have disaster relief funds, but basically money, right? These organizations need money so they can spend it on what they know they need to, not us sending what we think we need. I've seen an example is 
In the summer, people sent winter coats for some reason, and now we have a bunch of winter coats, and it's hot. We don't need them. So cash is king. Shelf-stable food. So when we send food, don't bake your favorite recipe and send it. It'll go bad. It'll get wasted. Shelf-stable means it'll last on the shelf. So the stuff that sits there, canned food generally is what's thought of. There's other stuff too. There's like pastas that's in plastic, but that's what folks need. Water. It's life-saving. It's life-giving, right? There's tons of water going into there, which is great. And they need volunteers. There are, how they're organized by the state is called Volunteer Organizations Active in Disaster. And that's where you can step in with your state emergency management agency, who will then hopefully be coordinating well with the local emergency management agency. And what I'm going to do is share the link to each of the emergency management agencies for North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Tennessee, and Virginia in the show notes. So go there. It's very easy. I went to all these sites to see how you can help, how you can donate, how you can give some cash, where you can send the food and the water and how you can volunteer. Thank you all for listening. I hope this was helpful. Um, I'll keep this up every few days or so as I stay informed. Um, as I know, I've had friends and former teammates that have gone down there and care about my fellow neighbors not far away from me. I am still under a bore water notice myself, but I am blessed that it is not worse for us here. Thank you to all those that stepped in, stepped up, stepped into harm's way to help their fellow Americans. Godspeed to the survivors and to the fallen, and God bless America.